We're walking through Matthew and we're be beginning a new section. And we're taking, we're walking through the entire book of Matthew for the year. And this next section is the name of the entire theme, Righteous Fruit. But it's this section here, Matthew 12 through 15. Now, we're going to see a lot of crops, fruit, food, and eating, okay? So make sure you have a good breakfast on Sunday mornings, otherwise you may not be able to focus, all right? This all begins very subtly with this verse. This is 12.1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. The disciples were hungry. Now, that's a practical issue. Jesus is, the more I, uh, the more I read the Bible uh, and looking at Matthew this year, uh, God and Jesus are concerned about the physical as well, well as the spiritual. We tend to over-categorize. Um, a, a practical issue is a practical issue that God's worried about, and it's also a spiritual worship uh, issue that, that Jesus is concerned about. But So let's take a look at the spiritual side. Are, are you hungry right now? Um, you probably heard this way too much from my father, but we Christians, and Bill's going to get mad at me, we Christians says have melancholy May. <clears throat> Bill's like, oh no, if I have to hear that again. I, I wish I didn't. I'm usually a contented, pretty happy person, but then I wake up at some point in May, and I kind of feel this funk, and I'm like, what's wrong with me? And then after a couple of days, I realize it's May. And melancholy May has kicked in. It's something um, when you're a descendant of Vikings, I think this is what makes you go, okay, I'm going to get on a boat and sail off into nowhere, okay? You know, this is, I guess that's what it's from. I don't know, but it's there. So Pentecost, which is today, by the way, uh, comes at a perfect time for me because I am hungry. My soul is hungry. Um, there's, there's a yearning deep down inside that wants to be filled. My, soul, my soul's belly is grumbling. Give me something. So in Pentecost, and then when I did the sermon schedule at the beginning of the year, even actually last year when I was putting it together, I have the, the main dates, you know, Easter, Pentecost, you know, you need to hit those. Um, and then so I'm like, okay, we, we really need the Holy Spirit here for Pentecost. And sure enough, Matthew comes through because we're walking straight through and then boom, Matthew quotes Isaiah 42 and the Spirit is the key. And so Matthew came through for me, came through for us as Pentecost does, as the Holy Spirit does. God provides now, the Pentecost is today, is our celebration, and you don't even see Pentecost on calendars anymore. It's, it's become just, it's kind of been washed away. It doesn't have a, there's no Pentecost hamster or something to make it stick around. We don't exchange cards or, you know, we got to come up with something. What do you think? You know, there's no bunny. We, we, uh, therefore, it, it, it doesn't have any sticking power, Okay. But today is, is Pentecost, and what we are is we're celebrating the Holy Spirit. We're celebrating being filled by the Holy Spirit. Today is the day that we celebrate the wonderful third member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Now let's just do a quick uh, Cliff Notes walkthrough with the Holy Spirit. Okay, where does Holy Spirit show up in the Bible? Well, pretty quickly, right? Genesis 1, 2, all right, the Holy Spirit is hovering above the waters, God's creative magic. Then you see, uh, as the Old Testament progresses, you see that the Holy Spirit is, is called God's right hand. Okay? Anytime God reaches down, the plagues, military victories, massive miracles is, is God's right hand. It's the Holy Spirit coming down and intervening in the world. And then, of course, in Exodus, it was the cloud by day and fire by night. The Holy Spirit filled the tent tabernacle. 
and guided Israel to the promised land, protected them. And then you see the Holy Spirit fills certain people for certain purposes. And it doesn't necessarily, if it fills somebody, it might leave them like Saul, okay? But when David was anointed by Samuel to be the next king, the Holy Spirit filled him. And then he says in Psalm 51, after he made his, his major moral lapse, one of many, um, but he said, Lord, don't take the Holy Spirit from me. Do not remove your spirit from me. Okay? Elisha was filled with the Spirit with the double portion of his mentor, Elijah. These, there was people, prophets, kings, people for specific purposes that were filled with the Holy Spirit. But then as the Old Testament progresses and we get into the prophets, we see this promise that the Holy Spirit is not going to just fill these certain important characters. There's going to be more. And so we have this Joel prophecy. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Okay, and there's more promises like this. This is just one of the more dramatic. Go ahead and read all of Joel. I, I read Joel this morning. Now, then in the New Testament, we see very quickly that John the Baptist is filled with the Holy Spirit in utero. Okay, remember that? And then Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit when? At his baptism. Yes. Okay. And then Acts 2 happens. And the resurrected Jesus told the disciples that it would. He said them, to them, hang out in Jerusalem and wait. Because Joel 2, Joel 3, is going to be fulfilled. And then, as, the, as we progress in the New Testament, we find that the apostles find that anybody can be filled with the Holy Spirit. They were extremely surprised to see that Gentiles were. Okay? And then they were like, we better baptize them because they've already been filled. Okay? So, <laughs> otherwise they probably wouldn't have. They didn't realize that this is for all nations. And so we see that anybody who puts faith in Jesus Christ is filled with the Holy Spirit on down through the years to little old us. And that's what we're celebrating today, is that we're filled with this very same Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. And what we're doing is we're going to count the benefits of that. So even though we uh, finished this section, the, the previous section was authority. Jesus was demonstrating his authority. He doesn't really stop doing that. It happens throughout the gospel. And this time, he is taking on Sabbath. Okay? And that is a big deal. Much to the annoyance of the Pharisees, he's taking on, this is their deal. Sabbath is their thing. Okay? And Sabbath is really important. Sabbath is one of the most distinguishing practices of the nation of Israel. Okay, it, it still is, isn't it? Uh, Murray grew up in Atlanta in, in a neighborhood called Dunwoody that is a Jewish neighborhood. And uh, sometimes she'd go over to some friends' houses and they'd say, Murray's here. <laughs> and so what you see on Saturdays there is you see a bunch of people in dark suits walking around. Okay, some are going, some have the curls, some don't, and there's synagogues right there, and they're walking. Okay, it's one of the distinguishing things still to this day about Judaism. And Sabbath was the Pharisees' bread and butter. Okay, uh, speaking of Murray, Murray's mom works for a school up there, and she's uh, in HR, so she's got all these forms. And you walk into her office, and there is papers everywhere. And she's got a little sign that says, this clutter is my bread and butter. OK? This is the Pharisees. This is their bread and butter. OK? Over the years, they've created all these rules. OK? The law was, was kind of vague on Sabbath. And so what they wanted to do was put a fence around the law. 
so that no one would actually accidentally or ha having to make a justification or decision would actually then cross the line. And so this became their means, their little power source. Okay, Sabbath was theirs. That was their territory. And Jesus was putting his toe over the line, big time. And what happened was, over the years, and by this power play, okay, by this, this is a power play for the Pharisees. This is the way they justify their existence. This is an, a protected industry, protected by the government, okay? Let's, this is, we're not going to let uh, this, you're not going to, don't set your foot over here and change our industry. And so what happened was a blessing, the Sabbath, was turned into a burden. And Jesus is never good with that. Don't turn a blessing into a burden. You see, Jesus actually had just addressed Sabbath in last week, just a few verses earlier. Do you want to listen to that? Let's hear it. Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Okay. See, that's God's intention for Sabbath, is it to be rest, for you to come on to him, to be in God's presence, and to rest and be healed. I think that was exactly what uh, Jack described in his Fresh Fruit, this passage. He said, God, I need to rest in you. And during that rest, God said, here's a couple things to learn as well. But the burden wasn't heavy. It was light, wasn't it? it had nothing to do with the medication, I'm sure. <laughs> but that, that's, that's what Sabbath is supposed to be. It's, it's our rest. And Jesus is saying, Let me, let's get back to what Sabbath actually means. Come into God's presence and rest and be healed. Take his yoke upon you. Learn from him. But the burden is not oppressive. The blessing's there. The burden itself is a blessing. And then Jesus confronts the Pharisees. He, he confronts this mess that the Pharisees have turned Sabbath into. And on the way, we can see why the Holy Spirit's so valuable, all the benefits of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to look at some of, we're going to look at Jesus' points right here, quickly. All right, David, uh, he, he goes back in the Old Testament, he's like, let me give you some exceptions of your little rules here. King David and the priests, okay? Why are these guys, why do they receive an exception, okay? And uh, Jim brought this up in the Bible study, because they have the Holy Spirit, that's why. The anointed and the appointed have exceptions, all right? The rules fall off. The fence comes down. Jesus walks across the water, okay? The rules don't apply anymore because the Spirit is in them. And here's some New Testament scripture uh, to speak to us about that. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Okay. It's, it's not just the guys that Manny's praying with in Kairos right now who are prisoners, is it? We have the Holy Spirit, therefore we have freedom. And then Jesus says in verse 6, I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. Wow. He's, he's getting really combative here. All right. Something, what, what's the value of the temple? He, the presence of God. All right. And Jesus is saying, you know what? The, the presence of God has long left your pile of bricks over there. 
but it came down and it's living inside of me. I'm the walking temple. That's what he's talking about. In three days, it will be destroyed and rebuilt. The, the disciples are saying, look at those stones. And he said, no, those stones don't matter. The value of the temple is the fact that the Holy Spirit is there. Thank you, Warren. That's well done. We have something of great value inside of us. And then he says in verse 7, If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. That's the second time Jesus in Matthew has brought up Hosea 6.6. 6. You would not have condemned the innocent. You know, we all, all Christians, lots of Christian organizations, and me, okay, need to know Hosea 6.6, 6, don't we? God desires love, not legalism. Okay? The Holy Spirit's in charge of convicting hearts. We are called to follow Jesus, not the Pharisees. Who did Jesus take on? He took on the people that were in charge of the religious institutions who were a bunch of jerks. That's who he took on. Who did he love? All the sinners and the lost sheep. Okay, we are to follow Jesus. We are not to follow the Pharisees. And I, I need that message as much as anybody, okay? I did that. I, I watched Les Mis last night until I fell asleep about halfway through. But what, uh, so I'm going to catch up on the second half. But what, what it, uh, my, my emotion from it, it is all about law and grace. And it just made me feel like, what in the world have I done? I'm, I'm no Jean Vanjean, or however you say it. I'm Norwegian, I'm not French. Okay. What, what, have I, what mercy have I shown? Here's this man who, who, goes, who has a life change, is born again, and then goes, goes around on a mission for mercy no matter what it costs him. What have I done? How have I been merciful? We have a spirit inside of, of us that is, has the power of God's mercy. And then in verse 8, he says, For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Okay, talk about authority. Jesus pokes his toe over the line and says, Hey guys, this is mine. You've made a mess. I'm going to clean it up and claim it back for God. Jesus is Sabbath. Come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Jesus is the Sabbath. I'm not sure what these, some of these Christian New Testament organizations are doing by going back to, as Paul will say in Galatians, you're going back to a bunch of rules. What are you doing? Every moment is the Sabbath. We have God's presence in sinus 24-7, therefore it is Sabbath. It doesn't matter what day it is. Since when did the calendar have authority over us? God has authority over time, space, everything, okay? There isn't a day to rest. We are in rest every day. We don't go off and, and take a you know, time out uh, from, from the Holy Spirit Monday through Friday, Saturday have you know, fun day, and then plug it back in on Sunday. We are at rest because the Holy Spirit is in us. Come to me is what he said. Don't go to something else. Don't go to a bunch of rules. The Sabbath is Jesus. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. So we have rest for our souls. Anytime we have God's presence. It does help, as I learned this morning, to come and worship with some other people, doesn't it? That's important. But we have the Holy Spirit in us. We have God's presence. We have Sabbath. And so our challenge is to live a Sabbath life all the time. There's not much rest at Boggy Creek, is there, Connor? But there is Sabbath, isn't there? And, and that's, that's uh, a good, good illustration. Uh, as we'll see, 
You know, unfortunately, we associate the Sabbath with doing nothing. Is that what Jesus did, the one we are to follow? Look at this. This is 9 and 10. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue. Notice how it's their synagogue. He's going in uh, to claim authority over something else. And a man with a shriveled hand was there. That's us. We can't do much. We're, we're limited in what we can do. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So this is, they're, they're licking their chops, thinking they've got him tricked. It's Sabbath. Should Jesus now do nothing? Is that what he does? Is that what Sabbath is about? 11 and 12, he said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then we know that Jesus healed the man. God's right hand became that man's hand and it was restored. That's what we need because we have shriveled hands you know, under our own power, unable to help, but God's right hand is with us, empowering us, healing us. What should we be doing on the Sabbath? We should be doing good. We should be lifting people out of the pit. We should be valuing people and helping them find Jesus and therefore finding healing and rest. That's what we should be doing. And if you get hungry on the way, go ahead and grab a snack because Jesus isn't a killjoy, is he? All right, they stopped at 7-Eleven on the way. All right. And Jesus isn't creating another legalism, and uh, a uh, do-goodism Sabbath. And uh, that's what we can quickly turn this into. Uh, put, put another heavy burden on ourselves, right? And say, okay, no, the Sabbath is now. Now I have to get busy. You know, now I... Now I have to do, 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 do. But Jesus isn't saying that. He said, my, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And this is what we find when we're guided by the Holy Spirit, not by guilt to do something, but guided by the Holy Spirit to use our gifts. We find that when we do serve, it doesn't wear us down, it builds us up. We're not exhausted, we're refreshed. We're not emptied, we're filled. And we're not burdened, we're blessed. So when we're in the Sabbath, when we're following the Holy Spirit, we go out and we're led to do the good things that we enjoy. I, I still, I've handed over the youth group to Nicole and that's been a blessing and, and we prayed for that and, and God provided. I still go to the every youth group though because it's a blessing. I don't wanna miss that blessing. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Okay, and then Matthew says, this is all, what Jesus is doing is he's fulfilling Isaiah 42. This is the value of Matthew and the other synoptics. Uh, there isn't this quote. And here's where the Spirit is mentioned by name. Listen to this. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he has brought justice through to victory. Mm -hmm. In his name, the nations will put their hope. Yeah, he, Jesus doesn't operate like the world. He's not relying on human power. He's relying on the Holy Spirit. Therefore, he's not starting a political power campaign. He's not creating and protecting an industry. He's not, he's not using military force. He's not trying out for American Idol. Okay? He's not concerned. He doesn't operate like the world does. What he did, what he did was he brought justice to victory. That's what it says brought justice to victory. He made things right. He took a messed up world, just like he did for Sabbath. He took something that was messed up, that humans had messed up, that overcomplicated 
used as, as a political power and, and corrupted, and he made it right. That's what he did. And that same Holy Spirit, and he did it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, how is Jesus resurrected? Because the Holy Spirit was in him. His ministry began when the Holy Spirit entered him in all four Gospels. There's just no question. All the power that was in Jesus was the Holy Spirit. As Paul said, that same power that resurrected him from the dead is in you and I. That same Spirit. There's only one Spirit. I'm not sure I'm tripped up on this Elisha asking for a double portion because there's only one, and it's just as powerful as anyone else's. So I think that may have been a, actually a little immature statement by Elisha saying, give me a double portion, but enthusiastic, so that's okay. But there's only one spirit, and that same exact spirit that was in Jesus is in us. And so that's the way you fix the world, one heart at a time, a transformation of the heart that the whole, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes a bad heart and makes it good. That's the way you fix the world. That's where the nations put their hope. Okay, we have the Holy Spirit, therefore we have hope. Let's pray. Dear Lord, help us by your Spirit celebrate the gift of your Spirit. Uh, we we are weak and our hands are shriveled and we're melancholy and hungry and so we need to be filled and we ask that your spirit would come and fill us this morning in jesus name amen